Well, good morning. I'm excited to share the word with you. I'm a little challenged by this, to be honest with you. Uh, we are in a, a series entitled, How to Honor God with Your Money. And yes, we're talking about uh, money this morning. And I'll tell you why I'm challenged by this, because a large part of my work is working with youth and young adults. And some of the things we hear from youth and young adults are stuff like, well, that's all the church ever talks about, is money. That's all you're about, is, is asking people to give and give and give and give. And let me encourage you, this is the first time we've spoken about money in about 10 years. Um, so bear with us today. Uh, another reason I'm challenged by this is because I believe, I know as I was developing this message, some of the stuff that I put together here stung me a little bit. It challenged me a little bit. I know most of you guys, and I've said this before, uh, most of you guys, we have, we have a pretty good relationship, so my, my challenge, my encouragement to you today is don't allow this to change the way you look at me. Don't be angry at me after this. I promise you it'll be okay. Uh, there, was a, there was a pastor who was preparing um, a stewardship, I guess, ser sermon series. He was going to preach several consecutive Sundays. And on one of these Sundays, one of his members stood up in the middle of the sermon and said, I'll be so glad when you quit preaching on money and get back to preaching the gospel. The pastor looked at him and said, I've never heard a good steward say that because giving is a part of the gospel. So if I were to entitle this sermon today, it would be in the form of a question. And I want to ask you guys this question. What matters most? What is it that matters most to you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity you give us to, to join together in worship, in fellowship, God. Most of all, to, to learn and to hear from you, God. So Father, we ask that as you speak, because we know you will speak, that you would help us to listen that you would help us to take heart to the words that are said, that are spoken from your word. God, we thank you for this time. We ask that you would bless it. Te teach us something new today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what matters most to you? I'm going to give you the bottom line, and if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to write this down. I didn't come up with it, so I can't take credit for it. But it says this. Treat money like your God, and it will plague you like the devil. If you treat money like your God, it will plague you like the devil. Anybody ever heard of Hetty Green? No? I'll tell you why you've never heard of her. She might have been the biggest miser who ever lived. Hetty Green's father died when she was 30 years old and left her with an inheritance of over $100 million in today's money. At the time, it was kind of unusual for women to be involved in banking and investments, but she concentrated all of her efforts and attention on growing the family fortune. Her focus on money drove a wedge between her husband and their two children, and the family was ultimately scattered. Known for eating cold oatmeal, I shared this with my wife this morning, and she was like, I like cold oatmeal. Known for eating cold oatmeal to save money for heating and washing only the hem, hem of her garment to save uh, money on soap. Uh, she was sometimes called the Witch of Wall Street. When her son broke his leg as a boy, she tried to have him treated at a free clinic for the poor before treating him at home. Ultimately, his leg would have to be amputated. When she died, Hetty Green was worth the equivalent of some $4 billion today. But she died alone and miserable. You see, because when we treat money like our God, ultimately it will plague us like the devil. I believe I can prove that fact to you using Scripture. But before we get the... Re you know what, I I'll have you turn there if you're, if you're using your Bibles. Uh, 2 Kings chapter uh, 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. We are in a series entitled How to Honor God with Your, with your Money. A uh, series that was launched by Mark McGrath, who gave us kind of a pre-series opener and did a phenomenal job and talked about the good thing versus the God thing, really laying it all out on the line for God. 
And Brother Dave Langford, Langford gave a phenomenal message on stewardship and Pastor Larry last week on trusting God for a supernatural provision. Now, a couple weeks ago as we were kind of uh, rolling through what we would talk about in this series, I remember sitting in the room, it was myself, uh, Pastor Ed and Mark McGrath, and we were just talking about, hey, well, how, can we, how can we flesh this out? And they come, came up with different topics. And I sat very quietly in a corner, not volunteering myself to speak on any of them, honestly. And uh, Mark and Pastor Ed both looked at me and said, Ernie, why don't you take the pitfalls of money? That's what we're going to talk about. Some of you are like, you know what, I'm sick and tired of hearing about money, but let me challenge that thought this morning. 16 of the 38 parables Jesus spoke on were concerned on how to, how to handle money and possessions. In the Gospels, an amazing eight, uh, I'm sorry, one out of ten verses, 288 in all, dealt, dealt directly with the subject of money. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, but more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions. How many of you would agree that God is trying to teach us something about money in his word? He is. Because the truth is, if we treat money like our God, it'll plague us like the devil. 2 Kings chapter 5, we're going to look at the account of Elisha and Naaman. And uh, we're actually going to read through or kind of breeze through the, the, whole, the whole chapter. And Naaman was the commander of this Syrian army. He was a great man in the sight of his master who was the king of Aram. He was highly regarded and valiant, but we read in verse 1 of chapter 5 that he also had leprosy. And Naaman, being the valiant, courageous man he was, had recently taken a young Israelite girl captive for himself. And I guess this young Israelite girl must have been subject to many a conversations from Naaman saying, hey, you know, this is a real struggle for me. Or even maybe she witnessed him kind of ailing and bandaging himself up or scratching, however it looked. This girl was subject to a lot of what Naaman was exposed to with this leprosy. And at one point she pipes up and says, if only my, man, my, my master excuse me, would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman hears this and he contemplates it for a little bit and finally he goes to his master, the king of Aram, and he says, hey, would you allow me the opportunity to go see this prophet Elisha who is said to be able to cure people of things like this, this leprosy. And so the king of Aram, without hesitation, the scripture tells us, says, go ahead, go. The scripture says in verse 5, so Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver. 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 sets of clothing. And he took a letter with him from the king of Aram that said this, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. And fast forward a little bit, Naaman makes this journey to the king of Israel and presents himself to him and uh, after some time Elisha hears that Naaman is there. And he sends for, 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 for Naaman. Elisha sends for Naaman and he says, Hey, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. So what does Naaman do? He goes right down to the Jordan. He dunks himself in seven times and he's cleansed, right? No. No. The scripture tells us that Naaman went away angry. It was all about him. It was all about how he wanted it done. He says, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the spots and cure me of my leprosy. It's all about me. It's all about how I want it done. Pastor Larry did a phenomenal job talking on this scripture a couple weeks ago. You should check it out. Are not uh, Abana and Farfar, far, the rivers of uh, Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them? In other words, why did I have to come all the way over here to be cleansed? You could have told me this from a distance. So he turned off and he went into rage. Now Naaman didn't travel by himself to see Elisha. He came with a group. And as he's storming off in a rage, some of his, um, his, his buddies, some of his, the people that went with him went up to him and said, hey, listen, this prophet told you this. If he's the man of God, isn't it worth a shot? Isn't, isn't it worth a shot to go ahead and just do what he says? You got nothing to lose by, by trying. You got everything to gain. So the scripture says he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored. 
became clean like that of a young boy. And I'd imagine the reaction must have been priceless to see Naaman's face. He must have been so excited, and he was. Rightfully so, at that point, he had been cured of, a, of what was seemingly an incurable disease, hadn't he? So Naaman naturally goes back to Elisha to say thank you. Thank you, Elisha. Thank you so much for what you did for me. You gave me the perfect instructions, and now I'm healed. Look, look, no more leprosy. It's gone. And Naaman says, you know what? I came here with, with these, the, 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 these monies, this silver, this gold, this clothing. Let me give you something in return for what you've done for me. That's a natural response, right? You want to pay people for the things they do for you, right? But the prophet answered him, verse 16, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will accept nothing. And even as Naaman urged him, he refused. Verse 17, If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much, as, as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down and he is leaning on my arm and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your ser ser servant for this. And Naaman finds himself in this place where he desperately needed God. How many of you have ever found yourself in that place before? True, right? We've all found ourselves in that place where we desperately needed God. So Naaman's natural response was to seek God. So he goes to Elisha. Elisha tells him, hey, go down to the Jordan, dip yourself in the, in the river seven times and be healed. Naaman's initial inclination was to resist God, though. But ultimately, he gave it a shot and found himself trusting God ultimately serve God. Now this, this exchange, the way I picture it, didn't go down just between Elisha and, and, and Naaman. There were other people there. I, I picture it kind of being like a conference room where there's these two interchanging, this, 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 this interchange between these two people, but there's other people. There's, there's a fly on the wall in there. And the fly on the wall I want to look at this morning is Gehazi. He's in the room there. And, and as, as Naaman comes back having been healed and he goes to Elisha and he says, let me give you something in return for what you've done for me. And Elisha's like, no, no, no. Gehazi's like, yes, yes, yes. Naaman, uh, Naaman goes on his way. Grateful to God. We go from Naaman's gratitude to Gehazi's greed. I'm going to show you here, I'm going to prove to you by this scripture, that when we treat money like our God, it will plague us like the devil. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 19 to 27. Let's take a look at how Naaman was blinded by greed. I mean, uh, Gehazi, excuse me. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. You read that again. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself. You see, when we're blinded by greed, we're liable like Gehazi to lie to ourselves. We lie to ourselves. Verse 21. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. And he said, is everything all right? Gehazi responded, everything is all right. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets. Did his master send him to say anything? Nope. Two men from the company of, prophet, of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept him. Was there much urging necessary there? No, probably not. And then he tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to his two servants, and they carried them to Gehazi. And when Gehazi came to the hill, he took things from the servants and put them away in his house. It reminds us of a familiar story in the book of Joshua, chapter 7, the story of Achan. He sent the man away, and, and they left. So Gehazi runs up to Naaman and he's like, yo, there's these two guys who have joined us and they need some money, they need some clothes. Gehazi's look, take, 
take a million dollars and take some Gucci or take some whatever, Valentino shoes or something like that, whatever it was at the time. Blinded by greed, Gehazi lied to name it. I mean, I think we do that too. Blinded by greed, we lie to others, don't we? We lie to ourselves about who we really are and we lie to others. All because we want it all to ourselves. It's all about us. Verse 25, when he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. What did he just do there? He lied. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot? And Gehazi's thinking, oh no, he got me. Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes? Or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male or female slaves? Listen to this. When you treat money like your God, it'll plague you like, you're, like the devil. Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It became white as snow. Blinded by greed, Gehazi lied to Elisha. You see, we lie to ourselves too, don't we? We lie to others simply to get more. And I think often we try to hide from God. Right? You see, Gehazi's action broke the relationship when he sought to enrich himself. His attitude was one of greed, of deception, of derogation of, of his superiors. And for his deceit with regard to Naaman, Gehazi was stricken with that same disease that Naaman had been cured from. Gehazi became ruled by greed. It was where his heart was. His character was revealed in this story, wasn't it? John Stott says this, covetousness is a self-destructive passion, a craving which is never satisfied even when what has been craved is now possessed. Just want more, just a little more, just a little more. Gehazi had it all. As a matter of fact, his name tells us he had it all. Gehazi's name, anybody know what it means? The Valley of Vision. Imagine that. You see, I believe Gehazi working side by side next to the man of God had some phenomenal things in store for his life. But because of greed, his vision became narrow. All he saw were those dollar signs. All he saw were those Gucci shoes, those whatever. You call it what it is for yourself. What matters most? God has placed incredible vision inside of us, hasn't he? It's so easy to become blinded by greed, by, by possessions, by the stuff of this life. We fall into it, don't we? I want to I give you this morning just four ideas, not all-inclusive ideas, but four dangers, pitfalls, if you will, of money. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said this, money often costs too much. It costs us too much. The first danger or pitfall of money is this. It's being ruled by it. Being ruled by money. If you're taking notes or if you're writing in your Bibles, if you highlight your Bibles, I'm going to encourage you to highlight a couple words here. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24 says this. Do not lay up for yourselves. I want you to highlight that word, yourselves. Treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. I want you to highlight that second yourselves, verse 20. The reason I want you to highlight that is because in verse 21, I think Jesus goes from making this kind of like a, a, a big charge to a more personal charge in verse 21. Because he says, for where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, he personalizes it here. For where my treasure is, there my heart will be also. In verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one, uh, hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. For you cannot serve both God and money. So is Jesus talking. So the question then is what matters most? What matters most? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
Let's call it what it is. Everybody has some treasure in this life, right? It's the, the main object, the thing you shoot for in this life. So my challenge to you is, it, is, is it your relationship with the Lord or is it other stuff? Is it money? Could be one of those things. You see, the point is that material possessions appear substantial and long-lasting, but they are subject to decay in a number of ways. And that means ultimate loss to the owner. Here's what Jesus says in verse 24. Basically, he tells us it's impossible to offer our allegiance to God and greed. It's impossible to offer our allegiance to both God and greed, or God and money. The truth is, money tends to draw people away from God. So Jesus warns about it. It's not a sin. Don't get me wrong. It's not a sin to have money. I'm not saying that this morning. But it is a sin to serve money. It's a sin to be a slave to money. The first danger, the first pitfall of money is being ruled by it. The second one is this. It's loving money. We know this already. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. It's a trap, Paul tells us. Into a snare into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people, that literally drown people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. You see, Paul recognized in writing this that money could be made easily, quickly, into a false god that brings all kinds of evil to those with those misplaced affections. However, money rightly used can advance the work of God and can be changed into heavenly treasure. Here's a, a question or a series of questions that really challenged me as I was putting this together. And while we're sitting here, I want you to ask yourselves these questions. Suppose someone were to offer you $1,000 for every soul you would earnestly try to lead to Christ. Would you then endeavor to lead more souls to him than you're endeavoring to lead to him now? Is it possible then that you would attempt to do more for money what you would hesitate or shrink back from doing now in obedience to God's command? So then the question is, is your love for money stronger than your love for God or for souls? Challenging, isn't it? The second pitfall is loving money. The third one is trusting in money. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes, their trust, on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything we enjoy. I think we know this already also, but riches are uncertain. Not only in their value, but in their durability. You think about it, your, your wealth can be stolen by a thief. Really, it can be. It, investments, we saw this a number of times, at least in my, my, my lifetime. Investments can drop in value at the drop of a dime, really. Time can ruin our houses. Time can ruin our cars. It's, it's God who gives us wealth, isn't it? So then we should trust him, the giver, not the gifts. So often we get that confused. You know, I wasn't going to share this, but I, I figured I might. Um, I remember a, a couple years ago, it, it, my parents had always raised me with uh, the notion in mind that what we have belongs to God first, and it was, a, it was great teaching because, you know, now I can apply that to my life. I remember when we bought our house, Pilar and I, um, 2015, a couple years back, um, we experienced some significant financial challenges, wouldn't you say? Um, but we learned to trust God through it all. And I'll tell you one such illustration. I, I remember um, not being sure how we were going to uh, pay a couple of bills that we were behind on. And um, we prayed and we asked God, still honoring God with our money. Hey, we're still tithing. We're still giving to the church. And um, I remember uh, being short about $250. I think that was the exact amount, right? And... Uh, I remember getting home one day and kind of just praying through it throughout the day, God, we need you to provide to us. We need you to provide to us. 
sitting in the mail um, was a check. And I opened it up, and it was from my, my car company. And uh, it was a check for the exact amount. Now, this doesn't happen with everyone. Don't, don't get me wrong. It, it could happen with you. Maybe not, though. Maybe God provides some other way. But it was the exact amount that we needed to meet our bills. God is faithful, right? We trust God. We don't trust our money. All right, next point. The, the last danger or pitfall that I wrote down here, and again, there's many more, is boasting in money. Boasting in money. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 to 24 says this. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this. That he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For these things, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. You see, the Lord rejects what, what would be common ground for us in boasting. Wisdom, strength, riches, the things we enjoy boasting about. Let's be honest. Our success, our wealth, our, our strength. But these verses put life's values into proper perspective. You think about it, when all the non-essentials are laid aside, the only appropriate basis for us to, to boast is that we know Christ, and that we understand the Lord. And Paul wrote it this way, quoting Jeremiah. He says, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I want to offer you uh, something of an antidote to these pitfalls. Uh, something of an attitude or attitudes we can adapt to, uh, to kind of fight these pitfalls, to fight the, the, those traps that we just spoke about. The first one is this. The first idea is ownership. Ownership. You see, everything we have in this world belongs to God and is only on loan to us. Dave Langford spoke about this a couple weeks ago. So keep in mind a couple of things. That God is the owner of all things. Psalm chapter 24 verse 1 says this. The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains. The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains. Keep in mind also that we came into this world with nothing. And we will leave it with nothing. Didn't Job make that clear? Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'll return. Keep in mind that everything we have comes from God. For he holds the cattle on a thousand hills, the psalmist tells us. This one challenged me uh, to my core. A and maybe it'll challenge you. This part may sting a little bit, to be honest with you. There is no such thing as a self-made person. There's no such thing as a self-made person. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. For who makes you different than anyone else? What do you have? What do you own? What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? See, everything we have in this world belongs to God. It is only on loan to us. And that's true of our money, of our possessions, but it's also true, if you think about it, of our family, of our career, of what we, think's our, what we think are our plans for the future. All of that is on loan to us. It's all God's. The second principle, and I'm not going to preach on this because Pastor Ed is actually going to share a message on this next week, is contentment. Contentment. What I want to do is I want to read a scripture as we close. If you would all stand with me, and worship team Mark, if you join me. Contentment. Two key attitudes, ownership and contentment. It's all God's. The second part is contentment. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 uh, through 13 says this. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. See, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength.
You see, so often we apply that to all other areas of our lives except for money. No, apply it to your money. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. God, we do thank you for your word that speaks so clearly to us today. It challenges us. It, it stings us sometimes, God, but we need that. So, Lord, would you help us if there's one of us or several of us here who are struggling with this area of finances, Lord. Would you remind us that we're not owners of what we have. We're simply called to be good stewards of what you've given us. Our stuff is on loan to us. Naked we come from our mother's womb. Naked we'll return, God. Lord, help us to take hold of that this morning, to be reminded of that, God. Father, we thank you for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.